OK. So this should take us up to. I think on your reading calendar, it would be. Uh, tomorrow's reading. Yeah, OK. Uh, again, for me, it's page 183. A couple of months after Irma died, Uncle Stanley fell asleep in the basement while reading comic books and smoking a cigarette. The big clapboard house burned to the ground, but Grandpa and Stanley got out alive, and they moved into, the, into a windowless two-room apartment in the basement of an old house around the hill. The drug dealers who'd lived there before had spray-painted curse words and psychedelic patterns on the walls and ceiling pipes. The landlord didn't paint over them, and neither did Grandpa and Stanley. Grandpa and Uncle Stanley did have a working bathroom, so every weekend some of us went over to take a bath. One time, I was sitting next to Uncle Stanley on the couch in his room, watching Hee Haw and waiting for my turn in the tub. Grandpa was off in the Moose Lodge, where he spent the better part of every day. Lori was taking her bath, and Mom was at the table in Grandpa's room, working on a crossword puzzle. I felt Stanley's hand creeping onto my thigh, and I looked at him, but he was staring at Hee Haw. Oh, your mom, Uncle Stanley's behaving inappropriately, I said. Oh, you're probably imagining it, she said. He's groped, he groped me. He cocked her head and looked concerned. Poor Stanley, she said. He's so lonely. But it was gross. Mom asked me if I was okay, and I shrugged and nodded. Well, there you go, she said. She said it was sexual assault and a crime of perception. If you think you're hurt, then, you're, then you are. And if you think you're not hurt, then you are. So many women make such a big deal out of these things, but you're stronger than that. And then she went back to her crossword puzzle. After that, I refused to go back to Grandpa's. Being strong was fine, but the last thing I needed was Uncle Stanley thinking I was coming back for more of his fooling around. I did whatever it took to wash myself at Little Hobart Street. In the kitchen, we had an aluminum tub you could, fill in, you could fit into if you put your legs up against your chest. But then the weather was warm enough to fill the tub with water from the tap under the house and bathe in the kitchen. After the bath, I crouched by the side of the tub and dipped my head in the water and washed my hair. But lugging all those buckets of water up to the house was hard work, and I would put off bathing until I felt I was pretty gamey. In the spring, the rains came, drink, drenching the valley for days in, in sheets of falling water. The water ran down the hillside gullies, pulling rocks and small trees with it sp and that spilled across the roads, tearing off chunks of asphalt. It gushed into creeks, which swelled up and turned a foaming light brown, like a chocolate milkshake. The creeks emptied into the tug, which overflowed its banks and flooded the houses and stores along McDowell Street. Mud was four feet deep in some houses, and folks' pickups and mobile homes were swept away. Over in the Buffalo Creek Hollow, a mine impoundment gave way, and a wave of black water 30 feet high killed 126 people. Mom said that this was how nature took her revenge on men who pillaged the land, ruining nature's own drainage system by clear-cutting forests and strip-mining mountains. Little Hobart Street was too high up the hollow to get any flooding, but the rain washed parts of the road into the yard and people who lived below us. The water also ate away some of the soil from around the pillars holding up our house, making it even more precarious. The hole in the kitchen ceiling widened, and, the ceiling on, and then the ceiling on Brian and Maureen's side of the bedroom started leaking. Brian had the top bunk, and when it rained, he'd spread a tarp over himself to keep the dripping water off. Everything in the house was damp. A fine green mold spread over books and papers and paintings that were stacked so high and piled so deep you could hardly cross the room. Tiny mushrooms sprouted up in corners. The moisture ate away at the wooden stairs leading up to the house and climbing them became a daily hazard. Mom fell through a rotted step and went tumbling down the hillside. She had bruises on her legs and arms for weeks. My husband doesn't beat me, she'd say when anyone stared at them. He just won't fix the stairs. The porch had also started to rot. Most of the banisters and railing had given way, and the floorboards had turned spongy and slick with mold and algae. It became a real problem when you had to go under the house. Most of us had slipped and fallen off the porch at least once. It was a good 10 feet to the ground. We have to do something about the porch situation, I told Mom. It's getting downright dangerous to go to the bathroom at night. Besides, the toilet under the house was now totally unusable. It had overflowed, and you were better off digging yourself a hole in the hillside somewhere. You're right, Mom said. Something has to be done. She bought a bucket. It was made of yellow plastic, and we kept it on the floor in the kitchen, and that's what we used whenever we had to go to the bathroom. When it filled up, some brave soul would carry it outside, dig a hole, and empty it. One day, while Brian and I were scrounging around on the edge of our property, he picked up a piece of rotting lumber, and there among the pill bugs and night crawlers was a diamond ring. 
The stone was big. At first, we thought it was neat junk, but we spit polished it and scratched and sorry and scratched glass with it like Dad had shown us, and it seemed real. We figured it must have belonged to the old lady who had lived there. She died before we moved in. Everyone said she was a little loopy. What do you think it's worth? I asked Brian. Probably more than the house, he said. We figured we could sell it and buy food, pay off the house. Mom and Dad kept missing the monthly payments, and there was talk that we were going to be evicted, and maybe still have enough left over for something special, like a new pair of sneakers for each of us. We brought the ring home and showed it to Mom. She held it to the light and then said we needed to have it appraised. The next day, she took it to the trailways bus to the blue field. When she returned, she told us it was, in fact, a genuine two-carat diamond. So what's it worth? I asked. That doesn't matter, Mom said. How come? Because we're not selling it. She was keeping it, she explained, to replace the red wedding ring her mother had given her, the one Dad had pawned shortly after they got married. But Mom, I said, that ring could buy a lot of food. That's true, Mom said, but it could also improve my self-esteem. And at times like these, self-esteem is even more vital than food. Mom's self-esteem did need some shoring up. Sometimes things just got to her. She retreated to her sofa bed and stayed there for days on end, crying and occasionally throwing things at us. She could have been a famous artist by now, she yelled, if she hadn't had children. And none of us appreciated her sacrifice. The next day, if the mood had passed, she'd be painting and humming away as if nothing had happened. On Saturday morning, not long after Mom started wearing her new diamond ring, her mood was on an upswing, and she decided we'd clean the house. I thought this was a great idea, and I told Mom we should empty out each room, clean it thoroughly, and put it back, put back only the things that were essential. That was the one way it seemed to me to get rid of the clutter. But mom said my idea was too time consuming. So we all ended up doing, all we ended up doing was straightening piles of paper into stacks and stuffing dirty clothes into the chest of drawers. Mom insisted that we chant Hail Marys while we worked. It's a way of cleansing our souls while we're cleaning the house, she said. We're killing two birds with one stone. The reason she'd become a tad moody, she said later that day, was that she hadn't been getting enough exercise. I'm going to start doing calisthenics, she announced. Once you get your circulation going, it changes your entire outlook on life. She leaned over and touched her toes. When she came up, she said she was feeling better already and went down for another toe touch. I watched from the writing desk with my arms folded across my chest. I knew the problem was not that we had all had poor circulation. We didn't need to start doing toe touches. We needed to take drastic measures. I was 12 by now, and I had been weighing our options, doing some research at the public library, and picking up scraps of information about how other families on Little Hobart Street survived. I had come up with a plan, and I had been waiting for the opportunity to broach it to Mom. The moment seemed ripe. Mom, we can't go on living like this, I said. It's not so bad, she said. Between each toe touch, she was reaching up into the air. We haven't had anything to eat but popcorn for three days, I said. You're always so negative, she said. You remind me of my mother. Criticize, criticize, criticize. I'm not being negative, I said. I'm trying to be realistic. I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances, she said. How come you never blame your father for anything? He's no saint, you know. I know, I said. I ran a finger along the edge of the desk. Dad was always parking the cigarettes, sorry, parking his cigarettes there, and it was ribbed with a row of black cigarette burns like a decorative border. Mom, you have to leave Dad, I said. She stopped doing her toe touches. I can't believe you'd say that, she said. I can't believe that you, of all people, would turn on your father. I was dad's last offender, she continued, the only one who pretended to believe all of his excuses and tales and to have faith in his plans for the future. He loves you so much, mom said. How can you do this to him? I don't blame dad, I said, and I didn't. But dad seemed hell bent on destroying himself and I was afraid he was going to pull us all down with him. We've got to get away. But I can't leave your father, she said. I told mom that if she left dad, she'd be eligible for government aid, which she couldn't get now because she had an able-bodied husband. Some people at school, not to mention half the people on Little Hobart Street, were on welfare and it wasn't so bad. I knew mom was opposed to welfare, but those kids got food stamps and clothing allowances. 
The state bought them coal and paid for their school lunches. Mom wouldn't hear of it. Welfare, she said, would cause irreparable psychological damage to us kids. You can be hungry every now and then, but you but once you eat, you're OK. And you can get a cold for a while, but you always warm up. But once you go on welfare, it changes you. Even if you get off welfare, you never escape the stigma that you are a charity case. You're scarred for life. Fine, I said. If we're not charity cases, then get a job. There was a teacher shortage in McDowell County, just like there had been in Battle Mountain. She could get work in a heartbeat. And when she had a salary, we could move into a little apartment in town. That sounds like an awful life, Mom said. Worse than this, I asked. Mom turned quiet. She seemed to be thinking. And then she looked up. She was smiling serenely. I can't leave your father, she said. It's against the Catholic faith. Then she sighed. And anyway, you know your mom. I'm an excitement addict. So this is page 189, section beginning, Mom Never Told. Mom never told Dad that I'd urged her to leave him. That summer, he still thought of me as his biggest supporter, and given that there was so little competition for the job, I probably was. One afternoon in June, Dad and I were sitting out on the porch, our legs dangling over the side, looking down in the houses below. The summer, that summer, it was so hot I could barely breathe. It seemed hotter than Phoenix or Battle Mountain, where it regularly climbed above 100 degrees. So when Dad told me it was only 90 degrees, I said the thermometer must be broken. He said, no, we were used to dry desert heat, and this was humid heat. It was a lot hot, hotter, Dad pointed out, down in the valley along Stewart Street, which was lined with those cute brick houses that had their neat square lawns and corrugated all in bre all aluminum breezeways. The valleys trapped the heat. Our house was at the highest on the mountainside, which made it, ergo, the coolest spot in Welch. In case of flooding, as we had seen, it was also the safest. You didn't know I put a lot of thought into where we should live, did you? He asked me. Real estate's about three things, mountain goat. Location, location, location. Dad started laughing. It was a silent laugh that made his shoulders shake. And the more he laughed, the funnier it seemed to him, which made him laugh even harder. I had to start laughing, too, and soon we were both hysterical, lying on our backs, tears running down our cheeks, slapping our feet on the porch. We'd get too winded to laugh any further, our sides cramping with stitches. Then we'd think our fit was over, but then one of us would start chuckling, and that'd get the other going, and again, we'd both end up shrieking like hyenas. The main source of heat for the kids in Welch was the public, sorry, the main source of relief from the heat for the kids in Welch was the public swimming pool. Down by the railroad tracks near Esso Station, Brian and I had gone swimming once, but Ernie Goad and his friends were there, and they started telling everybody that, that we Walses lived in garbage and would stink up the pool water something awful. That was Ernie Goad's opportunity to take revenge for the Battle of Little Hobart Street. One of his friends came up with the phrase health epidemic, and they were going on to the parents and lifeguards that we needed to be ejected to present an outbreak at the pool. Brian and I decided to leave. As we were walking away, Ernie Goad came up to the chain link fence. Go on home to the garbage dump, he shouted. His voice was shrill with triumph. Go on now and don't come back. A week later, with the heat still holding, I ran into Denisha Hewitt downtown. She had just come from the pool and had her, her wet hair pulled back under a scarf. Brother, that water felt good, she said, drawing out the word good so it sounded like it had almost 15 O's in it. Do you ever go swimming? They don't like us to go there, I said. Denisha nodded, even though I hadn't explained. Then she said, why don't you come swimming with us in the morning? By us, I knew that she meant the other black people. The pool was not segregated. Anyone could swim at any time, technically at least. But the fact was that all the black people swam in the morning, and then the pool was free, and then the white people swam in the afternoon when the admission was 50 cents. No one had planned this arrangement, and no rules enforced it. That was just the way that it was. I surely wanted to get back in the water, but I couldn't help but feel that if Denisha took, if I took Denisha up on her offer, I'd be violating some sort of taboo. Wouldn't anybody get mad, I asked? Because you're white, she said. Your own kind of might, but we won't, and your own kind won't be there. The next morning, I met Denisha in front of the pool entrance. My thrift shop one piece rolled inside my frayed gray towel. 
The white girl clerking the entrance gave me booth gave me a surprise look when we passed through the gate, but she said nothing. The woman's locker room was dark and smelled of pine saw with cinder block walls and a wet cement floor. A soul tune was blasting out of the eight track tape player and the black women packed between peeling wooden, the peeling wooden benches, singing and dancing to the music. In the locker rooms I'd been in, the white women always seemed embarrassed by their nakedness and wrapped towels around their waist before slipping off their underpants. But here, most of the women were buck naked. Some of them were skinny with angular hips jutting and jutting collarbones. Others had big pillowy behinds and huge swinging breasts, and they were bumping their butts together and pushing their breasts against each other as they danced. And as soon as the women saw me, they stopped dancing. One of the naked ones came over and stood in front of me, her hands on her hips and her breasts so close I was terrified. Denisha explained that I was with her and that I was good people. The women looked at each other and shrugged. I was going on 13 and self-conscious, so I planned to slip my bathing suit on underneath my dress, but I worried this was only make, would only make me more conspicuous. So I took a deep breath and stepped out of my clothes. And the scar on my ribs was about the size of an outstretched hand, and Denisha noticed it immediately. I exclaimed, I explained that I'd gotten when I was three and that I had been in the hospital for six weeks getting skin grafts and that's why I never wore a bikini. Denisha ran her fingers lightly over the scar tissue. It ain't so bad, she said. Hey, Nisha, one of the women shouted. Your white girlfriend's got a red blush. What you expect, Denisha asked. That's right, I said. Collard got, got to match the cuffs. It wasn't a line I heard Denisha use. She smiled at it and all the women shrieked with laughter. One of the dancers bumped her hip against me and I felt welcome enough to give a saucy bump back. Denisha and I stayed in the pool all morning, splashing and practicing the breaststroke and the butterfly. She flailed around the water almost as much as I did. We stood on our hands and stuck our legs out of the water and did underwater twists and played Marco Polo and chicken with the other kids. We climbed out to do cannonballs and watermelons off the side, making big geyser-like splashes and tended to drench as many people sitting poolside as possible. The blue water sparkled and churned white with foam. By the time the free swim was over, my fingers and toes were completely wrinkled and my eyes were red and stinging from the chlorine, which was so strong it wafted up from the pool and a vapor you could practically see. That afternoon, I was alone in the house, still enjoying the itchy, dry feeling of my chlorine scoured skin and wobbly bone feeling you get from a lot of exercise when I heard a knock at the door. The noise startled me. Almost no one visited us at 93 Little Hobart Street. I opened the door a few inches and peered out. A balding man carrying a file folder under his arm stood on the porch. Something about him said, government, a species dad had trained us to avoid. Is the head of the household in? He asked. Who wants to know, I said. The man smiled the way you do to sugarcoat bad news. I'm with child welfare, and I'm looking for Rex or Rosemary Walls, he said. They're not here, I said. How old are you, he asked. Twelve. Can I come in? I could see he was trying to peer behind me into the house. I pulled the door all the way closed, except for a clack, crack. Mom and dad wouldn't want me to let you in, I said, until they talk to their attorney, I added to impress him. Just tell me what it is you're after and I'll pass on the message. The man said that someone whose name he was not at liberty to disclose had called his office recommending an inquiry into the conditions at 93 Little Hobart Street, where it was possible that dependent children might be living in a state of neglect. No one's neglecting us, I said. You sure? I'm sure, mister. Dad work? Of course, I said, he does odd jobs and he's an entrepreneur. He's developing a technology to burn low grade bituminous coal safely and efficiently. And your mother? She's an artist, I said, and a writer and a teacher. Really? The man made a little note on his pad. Where? I don't think mom and dad want me talking to you without them here, I said. Come back when they're here. They'll answer your questions. Good, the man said, I will come back. Tell them that. He passed a business card through the crack in the doorway, and I watched him make his way down to the ground. Careful on those stairs now, I called. We're in the process of building a new set. After the man left, I was so furious that I ran up to the hillside and started hurling rocks, big rocks that looked like two hands to lift, into the garbage pit. Except for Irma, I had never hated anyone more than I hated that child welfare man, not even Ernie Goad. At least when Ernie and his gang came around yelling that we were trash, we could fight them off with rocks. 
But if that child welfare man got into his head that we were an unfit family, we'd have no way to drive him off. He'd launch an investigation and end up sending me and Brian and Lori and Maureen off to live with different families, even though we all got good grades and knew Morse code. I couldn't let that happen. No way was I going to lose Brian and Lori and Maureen. I wished we could do the skedaddle. For a long time, Brian and Lori and I had assumed we would leave Welch sooner or later. Every couple of months, we'd ask Dad if we were going to move. And he'd sometimes talk about Australia or Alaska, but he never took any action. And when he asked Mom, she'd start singing some song about how to get up and go and how to got up and went. Maybe coming back to Welch had killed the idea Dad had used to have of himself as a man going places. The truth was, we were stuck. When Mom got home, I gave her the man's card and told her about his visit. I was still in a lather, and I said that since neither she nor Dad could be bothered to work, and since she refused to leave Dad, the government was going to do the job of splitting up the family for her. I expected Mom to come back with one of her choice remarks, but she listened to my tirade in silence. Then she said she needed to consider her options. She sat down at her easel. She had run out of canvases and had begun painting on plywood. So she picked up a piece of wood, got out her palettes, squeezed some paints onto it, and selected a brush. What are you doing? I asked. I'm thinking, she said. Mom worked quickly, automatically, as if she knew exactly what she wanted to paint. A figure took shape in the middle of the board. It was a woman from the waist up with her arms raised. Blue, concentric circles appeared around the waist. The blue was water. Mom was painting a picture of a woman drowning in a stormy lake. When she was finished, she sat for a long time in silence, staring at the picture. So, what are we going to do? I finally asked. Jeanette, you're so focused, it's scary. You didn't answer my question, I said. I'll get a job, Jeanette, she snapped. She threw her paintbrush into the jar that held the turpentine and sat there looking at the drowning woman. All right, so I'm going to stop the recording there.